I got four points I want to make to you by the time I'm done with my message here. One of them is the following. How many of you guys would love it if you and I had the manual and the playbook of what our enemy used against us? Who would love to have that? Who would love that, right? Okay. I'm going to share with you two enemies we all have, which we'll talk about. I'll break that down for you. How to go about it with this enemy, and then the challenge to everybody at the end of the, end of the talk that I have for everybody here. What you do with it is completely up to you, but I do want to give everybody a challenge here by the time we wrap up. So, having said that, my message, my story. Can you make some noise if you're a student today? I'm just wanting to know the audience. Who's a student today? Okay. Well, let me, let me be more specific, because somebody may be 63 years old saying, I'm still reading books, I'm a student. Make noise if you're under 25 years old. Yeah. I saw a couple 40-year-olds making noise, but it's okay. We can feel that way. Make some noise if you're 25 to 45. Okay. Just so, anybody 45, exactly 45. The best age you can be, by the way, is 45. It's proven. It's going to be 46 next year, but right now it's 45. Make some noise if you're proud to be above 45. Wow. By the way, very, very revealing on why that's going to make me call a quick audible on my message. To those of you above 45, unbelievable to have as loud of a chant that you had here as well as below 25. We'll talk about you guys in here in a minute. How many of you have no clue who I am? Make some noise you have no idea who I am, so I can give you a look. You don't know who I am. You d How many of you listen to PBD podcasts? Anybody? Okay. Who watches a little bit of valuetainment? More PBD podcasts. It's okay. It's okay. So let me give you a little bit about my background. Born and raised in Iran. Um, I was born during the revolution, October 18, 1978, in Tehran, Iran. When my uh, mother's water broke, my dad's taking my mother to the hospital. There's curfew. He gets held up. He has to show that my mom's pregnant with me, goes to the hospital. I'm born. Next thing you know, three months later, the Shah's in exile. We stay. Iran's chaotic for the next 10 years, 10 and a half years. June 2nd or 3rd of 89, Khomeini dies. Six weeks later, my mother said, we can't stay here anymore. We escaped because my mother was afraid of me serving in the military in Iran. My dad's like, listen, do what you guys got to do. You guys got to go. We go to Germany. We live in a refugee camp in Germany, in Erlangen, Germany. Had a great time for about a year and a half. And we come to the States, November 28, 1990, a day I'll never forget when we're crossing, we go to New York. The moment I land in New York, I'm walking around in the airport. I'm looking for gremlins. I'm looking for Rocky. I'm looking for all these guys. I'm thinking America's like this dream of mine, right? I watched Rocky for a few hundred times in Farsi. Little weird, but I watched it in Farsi a few hundred times. And then finally come here. We live in Glendale, California. Not Glendale, Arizona. Glendale, California. Any, any Californians here? Yes or no? By the way, any Texans here? Texans? Any Floridians here? Here's, here's what I can tell you. If California and Texas could have a baby, it's Florida. That's why I live in Florida now, just so you know. I've lived in California, I've lived in Texas, and I live in Florida, and I love it in Florida. But I still have a, I love the other two states I lived in as well. Let me continue. So I go to high school, I get out. Um, I decide to join the Army. I go to the 101st Airborne Division Air Assault. Thank you. Anybody else here served? Who else served here? Anybody served? Thank you for your service. One of the best decisions I made in my life. I end up getting out of the Army. When I get out, it was because of my citizenship date I had. June of uh, 1999, I become a U.S. citizen. So for some of you wondering if you can join the Army with a green card, you can, because I was in the Army with a green card, just so you know. Some people just freaked out a little bit, but that's what happened with me. So I get out, and I don't know what I want to do. At that time, I was a bodybuilder. That was my dream. I was going to go be Mr. Olympia, go into Hollywood, marry a Kennedy, be a governor. And then <laughs> I, I met a girl named jean Vierre who introduced me to Morgan Stanley Dean Witter. Uh, day before 9-11, I started working at Morgan Stanley Dean Witter. I get my Series 766-3126 Life and Health. I fall in love with the financial industry. 
um, next day it's 9-11. I leave Morgan Stanley, I go to Transamerica World Financial, I'm there for about seven and a half years, I see what's going on with the marketplace, and then in September of 2009, start our own insurance company and then, you know, takes off. But I want to tell you a couple things that happened in 2009. March of 2009, my wife and I, we start dating. I've kind of found the industry I want to be a part of. I love numbers and I love the financial industry. I love people, so that's a great combination. I found the girl that I think I want to marry. We've been dating now for four years. We've known each other for about five and a half years. I am making money. I've heard the magical words from my parents, I'm proud of you. But at this point, I'm realizing this thing cannot be about money. And I'm trying to figure out what I need to do. So I bring a handful of people I respect a lot. One of them was my pastor, a couple of the gentlemen that I had. I said, listen, I need your help. I need to find my purpose. There's no way in the world God put me here to just go make money. I want to find out exactly what that reasoning is. This is too chaotic and a strange life I've lived. Why did you do this to me? I want to know. One of the mentors takes me to an event at Miramar Hotel Santa Monica uh, with Claremont Institute. Anybody knows Claremont Institute, Larry Arn, all those folks. Anyways, I don't know whether you like him or not. It was a good event for me. I go to this event. A man named George Will gets up there and speaks, talks about how lawyers are ruining America. Any lawyers in the room? If you know, some of you guys are ruining America, but that's a whole different story. I don't want to digress. And then afterwards I meet, and the gentleman that introduced me says, hey, you know, George, Patrick wants to know what to, he should commit his life to, what purpose? He says, where are you from? I said, Iran. He says, why don't you go study why so many people around the world come to America? Why do we only call America the American dream, no other place? I leave, and that becomes my obsession. That's March of 29th. Three months later, my wife and I get married on June 26th of 09. Three weeks, three weeks, by the way, our youngest daughter was born June 26th on our wedding day, which is kind of like it's no longer that necessary. Now it's her day. It used to be our anniversary. Now it's her day. Three weeks later, we put an event together. I'm on fire at this time. We put an event together at JW Marriott called Saving America, Doing the Impossible. I'm dressed as a Middle Eastern George Washington, okay? Unfortunately, you can find this picture on Google. That's the disappointing part. My wife is dressed as Lady Liberty. She looks like Lady Liberty because she's from Texas. When we got married, it was kind of funny because I'm from Iran, and, and she's from Texas, and there's about 500 people at the wedding, and, and all the blue-eyed, green-eyed people on one side, they're not dancing. All the hairy people on the other side, you know, <laughs> why are you laughing? All the hairy people on the other side, they're not getting up. Finally, one of my friends that night, who was one of my groomsmen, was sponsored by a couple guys you may recognize, Jack and Jose, and he spent a little too much time with these two guys. If, if you know what I'm saying, you know what I'm saying. If you don't know what I'm saying, you know what I'm saying, okay? <laughs> so he gets up, and he says, look, some of you guys are worried. You don't want to dance. You're wondering if this marriage is going to work out or not. Trust me, I'm worried as well. When they first started dating, I said, why would a girl from Texas, nice little girl, why would she marry this big, scary-looking guy from Iran? Why would she do that? He says, I finally figured out what these guys have in common. They have two things in common. Everybody's waiting. Texas, Iran. They both like oil and weapons of mass destruction. It's going to work out. It's going to be all right, okay? Obviously a terrible joke. But everybody laughed, we got up, we danced, all that, it was amazing. Anyways, so we put this event three weeks after we get married. I got a 40-foot Mount Rushmore on the stage, 40 American flags. I bring a speaker to talk about the Star Spangled Banner, another one to talk about capitalism, uh, the son of Ronald Reagan, just to tell stories about Ronald Reagan. Just tell stories, that's all I want you to do. Tell stories about your father, right? Three months after that, we started an insurance company, and we grew that insurance company from 66 agents to today we have roughly 50,000 agents nationwide, a few hundred offices nationwide, and we've been uh, 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 very grateful last year where we partnered with a great organization called Integrity. I've been fortunate enough to do a lot of incredible things in my life, travel, dreams that don't make any sense to me. I'm married today with four kids. Life is amazing. God's been unbelievable to me. If there's anything in my life I've been talking a lot about lately when I'm going around, it's 
I'm finally openly talking about my biggest fear I have in life. I don't fear a lot of things. If there's one thing I fear in life, and I can't even tell you how unbelievable a fear this is, I fear losing God's favor. It is the biggest fear I have. And by the way, I'm not, I, the only reason I share that with you is because when I look at that flag, I think America, for God knows how many years, has been known as the greatest country in the world. It has forgotten and no longer fears losing God's favor. We are now afraid to pray in schools, but we're okay with teaching all these other things to our kids. I'm not okay with that. I'm a pretty easygoing guy. We can sit down, tell jokes, pull a couple pranks, play domino, play backgammon, talk sports, talk politics. If you cross the line and impose yourself on my kids, you're gonna meet a very different human being, period, right? And I'm convinced many of you feel the same way as well. Having said that, let me talk about a couple different things here when I say to you about the enemy. If I would ask you right now, who do you think is the enemy of the state? Who's the number one enemy we got in America today? I want you to scream it out. Tell me who you think it is. Who do you think it is? Say it. Say it louder. Who do you think it is? All right. Let me give you a few names and tell me if you agree some of these guys are enemies. Would you say mainstream media is one of the enemies? Would you say the establishment's one of the enemies? Would you say those on the outside, China, Iran, whatever other countries are, who hate what America stands for, is one of our enemies, yes or no? Would you say some of the people on the inside that hate what, what America stands for, yes or no? How about our educational system and all those unions, are they one of our enemies? How many more you want me to go through? I got a list of them if you want me to go through. LGBTQ indoctrination. I can talk about Larry Fink, central banks, defense contractors, lobbyists, rhinos. I can continue. Hollywood, entertainment, globalism, keep going with all these names. However, at 28 years old, I made a decision in my life. I was constantly asking this question of why I'm here and what drives me. Is the goal in life, Patrick, to be a millionaire? No. Is the goal in life to be a billionaire? No. And by the way, I'm talking about the pinnacle. I want to know what's the top of the top. What is the one thing worth me giving my entire life to? Is it me wanting to be a great father? Number one, no. Is it to be a great husband? No. Is it to be a great capitalist? Not the number one. Is it to live a fulfilled life? It's not the number one. Is it to be funny, fun, all that stuff? Not number one. And I kept going through it. All that stuff is great, but it's not my number one. See, what's crazy is a lot of us in here have a lot of people we love. And a lot of you in here have a lot of people that love you. Everybody has that. But there's a very big difference between being loved and being respected and being admired. One can love their husband, but maybe they're saying, man, he no longer lights it up like he used to. He used to work and drive and go and get after it. He was fearless. He used to be like that 15 years ago, but all of a sudden he lost that fire in his eyes. What happened with that? But she'll never tell you. She admired a man of 15 years ago. Your parents may love you, but your father, when he looks at you, gives you a look and says, why doesn't my son give his best? I wish I admired my son, but he loves you. There comes a point in your life where you got to say, I want to be loved and I want to be admired. There was nothing in my life more important than being a leader amongst leaders. And when, you're, when you realize if the number one is being a leader amongst leaders, does that mean you need to be a great father? Absolutely. Does that mean you need to be a great husband? Absolutely. Great wife? Yes. Great capitalist? Yes. Great contributor to society? Yes. Have a backbone to stand up? Yes. Because the number one pinnacle in life is what? Being a leader amongst leaders. You know who's looking for that right now? The man upstairs. I'm convinced the man upstairs looking down right now saying, what happened to this incredible country that loved God? 
and, and they would constantly talk about it. Man, I am looking for a new generation of leaders to rise up. I believe God is looking for the next generation of flag carriers. And to be people like that, you have to be leaders amongst leaders. By the way, this is a tough decision for us to make because we don't like that kind of responsibility. We don't like that kind of pressure. However, what clip did Glenn Beck play at the end? Why do you and I watch that movie and get emotional? Why do you watch the movie Gladiator and we get fired up when we watch Gladiator? Why do you love that scene? Why do you love the scene when he gets up and he turns around? Show your face, Gladiator. And he takes it. Why do you love that scene? Because deep down inside of you, I don't know what it is. He put something in us that we want to be leaders amongst leaders, but we're scared sometimes. And that's okay. It's okay to be scared at times. But someone's going to wake your ass up every once in a while. If today that's me to you, it was somebody else 15 years ago, I don't have a problem being that person. FYI, some of you guys are saying, Pat, I consider myself a leader amongst leaders. That's great. But everybody came to this event with a different outcome. Some of you came here, quite frankly, let's just say it, is because for whatever reason, Turning Point USA attracts a lot of young, good-looking people. You know what I'm saying? You're kind of like, oh, you know, I hope I meet somebody. I hope I meet somebody. Some of you came here because you came with your granddaughter or your grandson or your daughter, and you're wanting your kids to be in an environment that you can trust for them to become great leaders. You're hoping something happens, fire, fire's lit under your kid. You're hoping that happens to you. Some of you guys are here, it's because it's you. You're like, man, I'm looking for something to get me to the next level. I want to wake up and do something big with my life. I feel like I haven't had it for a while. Everybody's got a different outcome. But we just talked about the first enemy. The first enemy is what? We love talking about outside enemies, right? Which is what? Yeah, that globalist. Yeah, mainstream media. Yeah, this, yeah, that. No problem. They are enemies, but they're only one of the enemies. But the only reason they win is because of the second enemy. Let me unpack the second enemy for you. Here's the second enemy. I'm convinced the second enemy are three communities. Number one is the tolerant Christians are one of those enemies. Good people, sweetheart. You've learned 20, 30, 40 different scripture. Oh, God, praise the Lord. <laughs> praise the Lord, John 3, 16. Oh, mm, Proverbs. Yeah. It's okay. They can also, it's okay. What interpretation do you have of who Jesus was? Do you think Jesus was a guy that was going around saying, yeah, yeah, it's okay, it's okay, it's okay? Or do you think he stood up and he managed expectations with other people? Are we confused in these churches? Are we confused? So to me, the number one enemy is these tolerant Christians. They're not being called out. They're not being called out. I go to so many different churches. Well, why is donation down? Why is this down? Why do you think it's down? FYI, we can sit there and be upset about Muslims as much as possible and act like we're victims. You know what they're doing? They're simply having more kids than you. Why are you upset? So can you imagine if somebody says, well, these Muslims, look how they're growing so fast. Just 50 years ago, we were three times the size of them, and now they're the same as us. And in the next 30 years, they're going to be running Senate and Congress and governors. Why do you sound like you're scared? Why don't you go have four, five, six, seven, eight babies? Why, 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 do you, why do you stop saying lines like the following, where it's like, well, you know, my husband and I, we want to spend five years together, and then at 35 years old, we'll think about having a kid, because you know it's a lot of work having a kid. What do you think is the biggest juice of life? You think it's a nice house? You think it's a nice car? Or you think it's having a kid? Oh my God, one of the greatest gifts we have, if you're able to do it with health. I don't want to impose this on some people who God won't even help you have kids because you're wanting to have kids. There's so many people that want to have kids that can't. But if you can't have kids, go. Four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten. Go. Raise them with the right values. Be tough on them. Challenge them. Love on them. Spend some time talking to them about all the things that's taking place in America today and the world. Don't be afraid of it. Because if you don't do it, the school's going to do it. And then one day you're going to be like, how the hell did I lose my kids for a decade or two? Because you didn't talk to your kids about all the things that they were facing. So number one enemy on the other side are tolerant Christians. Let me talk about the second one. Are the do-your-thing libertarians. Look, man, you know, as long as you do your thing, I don't care what you do. You want to smoke weed? Go ahead. 
You want to go do this? Go ahead. Go do shrooms if you want to. Do your thing. Now, I, I don't think this is a libertarian community. But libertarians also have been saying, do your thing, do your thing, do your thing. And guess what the schools are saying? Well, thank you so much. Guess what we're going to do? We're going to do our thing with your kids. Thank you so much, libertarians. You guys are awesome. You guys are so awesome because you said, do your thing, and we are. You're not running for the board in school. We are. And we control what's being taught to your kids. We love do your thing, libertarians. They're ruining America. Number three, you know this next one? <sighs> These are the, now I'm gonna tell you this in a different angle. These are the, and, and by the way, it's not a lot of the crowd here, but there's a lot of them out there because I know some of you guys, who you are and what you're doing. It's the lazy, scared, rich conservatives. <laughs> Let me explain before you're offended and you go slash our tires outside and I can't make it to my hotel room. You know what this community is? You know, it's the community where it's kind of like, no, look, you know, we can't tell people what we believe in because we may lose those guys over there that invite us to the cool parties. We can't tell them what we believe in. We can just say, yeah, you know, we kind of this, this, that. Wishy-washy? What? What do you stand for? What, what, is you, what do you stand for? Do you have a backbone? What do you stand for? By the way, while you're sitting there investing your money in all these other things, Mark Benioff, Jeff Bezos buys WAPO. For how much? $500 million. That's nothing. Time Magazine, a few hundred million dollars. Nothing. LA Times bought for $500 million, nothing. I may be out by 50 million bucks, but that's nothing to many of the rich Republican billionaires that are in the room or out there. You mean to tell me you couldn't buy LA Times? You mean to tell me Forbes family sells Forbes to a Chinese company that owns 90% of it and they announced the International Woman of the Year, Hillary Clinton? What? What are we talking about? So you can't go buy Forbes? You can't go buy Fortune? Why would we be these, buy these types of companies? because media is communicating the messaging to people. You gotta pick up some of these platforms. Well, no, but it's the rate of return. No, it's also a portion of your money needs to be invested in things that's not about a rate of return. It's about what this country's done for you. You gotta go and buy some of these platforms so we can persuade and build the next generation. So now, these two enemies, we know. One of them on the outside, great. Second one is us. If you're always saying it's the enemy, it's the enemy, it's the enemy on the outside, what you're telling the world is you're helpless. And this community, we're not helpless. That's not a language we use. We're doers. Do you understand that? So we cannot use that language when we're going out there. Let me continue. Next part. Next part. I think we have to do a better job selling our values and principles. Charlie does a great job selling it. I think he's one of the best. He's fantastic. Elon is doing it in his own way. Others are doing it in their own way. We need to get better at selling some of the values and principles that we have because our values and principles are proven. The way we raise kids, the way we raise communities, the way we built, you know, U.S., a brand spanking new startup country, 1776, into the greatest country in the world. How do we do this? China had been around with a couple thousand years. Iran been around for 2,500 years. We do it brand spanking with a startup called United States of America, yes. Our ideas are proven. Everybody else works for our companies. They work for our companies. Walmart employs nearly three million people worldwide. I think two million is here, another million is outside of here. We create jobs for others. We need to tell that story better. We're getting better, but we're not there yet. Now, a couple other things. How many of you love bullies? Who loves bullies? How many of you love bullies? How many of you know there are certain bullies right now that we're dealing with, yes or no? There's two rules I got with my kids when it comes down to bullies. We don't bully other people, but we also don't get bullied. However, um, COVID was obviously a terrible event that took place. One life lost is one too many, okay? However, let's set that aside. COVID was also maybe one of the best events that took place if you look at it from the perspective of knowing 
the playbook the enemy wanted to use against you. So they all of a sudden went like this with their hand, and they were shameless about it. And if we saw their hand and we don't do anything about it, whose fault is it? So now here's a mistake we typically make. If you're a Christian, we tend to be very forgiving. We have something called grace, right? We're forgiven, we have grace. Well, so it's okay, let's just move on. We need accountability. We need to find out what happened. We need to find out if they did the right thing or not. We need to find out what happened with Fauci. I simply want accountability. We need to find out what China did. Why are we forgetting about the fact what happened with Wuhan? I simply want accountability. Because without accountability, you know what you're telling the world? You know what you're telling the world when there's no accountability? It's like if your kid does something and there's no punishment, guess what you're telling them? You can do it again and again and again. That's what we're teaching everybody. There is no accountability. This concept about being afraid of some of these companies going out of business, they need to go out of business. Anybody knows what a zombie company is? A zombie company is companies that only survive by borrowing money. If they don't keep borrowing money, they don't pay operating expenses or nothing. So they go out of business if they don't borrow, okay? In 1997, only 1% of companies in America were zombie companies. You know what the number is today? 25%. 25% of companies in America are simply surviving by constantly borrowing money. Let them go out of business. Let them go out of business. Let the right people operating, operating the right businesses. We need to kind of talk about some of these companies that are not doing it right. I'm sorry, you're not a good operator. Go work for the other guy. You're not meant to be a founder. You're not meant to be a CEO. You're meant to be an executive in the other guy's company. You're still going to make money, but it's a different mindset to be an operator. That's the part of accountability. Nope, but we're afraid for people to fail. The whole concept about capitalism is four things. Freedom to buy, freedom to sell, freedom to try, and what's the last one? freedom to fail. They got to fail. If they don't fail, there is no capitalism. So we have to sit there and say, listen, these guys that are making it, that's totally fine, but watch this. Let's talk about these bullies. The one thing about bullies is the following. What most people don't realize about bullies is, so imagine you talk to a bully, and here's what a bully tells you. If you do that, I'm going to whoop your ass. If you do that, I'm going to call all my guys to come after you. They're around the corner. And you're like, oh my God, I'm so sorry. I'm so sorry, please don't do anything. Yeah, yeah, I'm so sorry. Okay, I'm just gonna, I'm so sorry. And then all of a sudden, sometimes you tell the bully the phone. You say that one more time, I'm gonna get the guys. I got 20 people around the corner waiting to whoop your ass. And you just say, call them. Call them. What do you mean? Matter of fact, let's go find your 20 guys. Let's go together around the corner. You ready? Let's go. What, 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 what do you mean? But maybe they're not there right now. Because you're bullshitting me, guy. There is no other person behind you. Your argument isn't that valid of an argument. Bullies aren't as tough as people think they are, but they're very good at selling you on that concept. They're very good at convincing you they're powerful. They're not. So watch this. What method do they use? So why are so many people scared to sell their values and principles to others? Here's why. The game plan they use is shame. Glenn talked about it briefly earlier. They'll shame you. So people are like, well, what if they find out that what if they find out that I got a DUI 22 years ago? And what if they find out that I filed bankruptcy? Then what if they find out? 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 And then all of a sudden you'll catch yourself living this life. You know what this life is? Handcuffs and shackles because you're afraid of shame. And you have this notion in your life that you're supposed to live a perfect life. I'm not living a perfect life. I'm trying to live a magical life and doing my best to improve, but by them doing this to you, and the reason why what, what Donald Trump did that was very unique, is he said, what do you want to shame me with? Go ahead. Boom, he put it back on them. 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 Like, what am I going to do with this guy? Character assassination, financial assassination, what's left in this playbook? We've done everything to this guy, and he would stand up right there. And some people started realizing, maybe I need to just stand up, so they'll use shame against you, They'll use guilt, they'll use apathy, they'll use grief, anger, distracting you, judgment, constantly, every one of those things, and you'll sit there and say, eventually, you know what, I'm not doing it. 
So imagine if there's a press conference. Let's just say you're running for office. I'm going to paint a picture to you. Watch this one here. Um, so all this stuff that's going on, they're embarrassing every article, 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 article. Negative. Defamation of character nonstop. And this one reporter is asking a question. I'm sorry, what's your name? Mary Jane. Fantastic. Mary Jane, all these things you're challenging me on for my lack of perfection in my life, fair, you can keep doing that. Can I ask the audience a question? Yes. And you look dead at the camera. And he said, anybody who ever went to high school with Mary Jane, anybody who has any dirt on Mary Jane, anybody who was ever Mary Jane's ex, anything that Mary Jane ever did in the past, finances, stole money from you, Maybe you're a cousin, your niece, you're all this stuff. Whatever dirt you have on her that she backstabbed you, odds are, Mary Jane, there's somebody that hates you. Can you please start sharing some of that information with us on Twitter? Can you do that? And then she's like, no, you can't say that. I'm not trying to say that. But if you, obviously, the way you're shivering right now, Mary Jane, watching your body language, are worried about you not living a perfect life, why are you doing it to me? Why don't you question my policies? What do you not like about my policies? Let's debate it. What do you not like about my ideas? Let's debate it. But if we're going to have this argument of whether you walk on water or I do, neither one of us are qualified. So knock it off and let's move on. Can we do that? Well, you know, you know, we need to little impose, impose and put the fear back in them, not the other way around. We need to challenge them and kind of get them thinking and say, whoa, I'm kind of nervous a little bit because of what this guy did. He flipped it on me. Yes. Flip it on them. What do you want to know about me? Yeah, I've made some mistakes. What else do you want to know? We need to do more of that. This concept of being perfect. And by the way, we have a couple candidates. One mention them. One of them I like a lot. But unfortunately, the reason why his campaign doesn't do well is because he has this idea of walking on eggshells. He has to be perfect. And guess who doesn't relate to him? The American voter. I'm sorry to say this to you. Some of you guys say, I don't know who you're for. We have some candidates that walk on eggshells. They just want to be sold as a perfect candidate. I remember one time I want to fly back with Bill O'Reilly. This is 2012. This is when he was doing the stuff with Dennis Miller. I'm going from Burbank to Vegas for a convention. Bill O'Reilly sitting right next to me. I'm like, Bill, what happened with Romney and Obama? He said, I'll tell you a story about what happened with Romney and Obama. So what's that? He says, we called both camps and we said, guys, you're not going to get elected if you don't come on Fox. And Romney's camp said, no, they didn't come on. But Obama's ca uh, campaign manager called me back and we had a conversation together and says, what did the campaign manager say? He says, the campaign manager said, it's done. Bill is like, no, it's not. If you don't bring Obama on the show, you guys are not winning. He says, it's over. He says, what do you mean it's over? He says, well, he had a shot. The shot was on the second debate. Do you remember when Obama went down on the second debate and Romney came up? He says the third debate, apparently his marketing team or whatever, his campaign manager told him, you're not getting the single woman's vote. You were a little too tough on Obama and they don't like it. Change your approach. He says the moment he fell for those consultants, he failed. It was over with. You know how many candidates we got that they're listening to consultants? You know what America wants to know about? What do you stand for? Tell me what you stand for. The consultant's not running. What are you running for? I like talking to Vivek because I feel like Vivek's talking to me. I like talking to certain candidates because I feel like they're talking to me. You talk to the establishment, it's like the talking point. Here's the 17 points to hit. Here's the script. Here's the line. Here's the this. Dude, we don't want a robot as a president. We want a real human being that I can relate to and I can say, this guy's going to get it done. I'm not expecting perfection out of you, but I want you to be a leader and get it done. That's what we want as Americans. At least that's what I believe we want as Americans. So, if the standard you're willing to take here tonight when we leave is wanting to be a leader amongst leaders, there's a couple things we got to be thinking about. Number one, anticipation. 2024 is going to be very chaotic. It's going to be weird. There's some weird movies coming. How many of you guys saw the recent movie, Leave the World Behind? Anybody saw that movie there? Oh, okay, yeah, you know all these, what are you, Am I watching a movie or is this a documentary realistic thing? And then I'm seeing Mark Zuckerberg just spent $100 million building a house in Hawaii with a nuclear bunker. What does he know that the rest of the world doesn't know about? Talk about the timing. Oh, 
accidentally, coincidentally, a week after that movie comes out, a new movie comes out. What's the name of that movie? Civil War. Civil? Huh. Leave the world behind. Our power grid in America hasn't been updated. 75% of it hasn't been updated in kind of 50 years. And, and you're kind of talking about that. Then you're pinning whites against blacks. There's a line in the movie that says, Dad, you know if something goes down, we can't trust these white people. I know that's something both you and mom agree on. Why do you put that line in the movie, Barack? And you were helping with the script. Why would you put that in the movie? Why would you put that in the movie? Barack, weren't you the same guy that gave a talk at the DNC in 2004 about bringing people together? What happened to that guy when he gave that speech? By the way, there's something that our brand by Tim and PBD podcast is slightly different in. Here's what it is. I like talking to everybody. I like talking to everybody. Someone goes, I can't believe we talked to that guy. I'm like, dude, if you like, I like talking to anybody. Who knows some of the weird people we've spoken to? Anybody's ever seen Anthony Weiner on our podcast? Yes or no? Was that a weird podcast or what? How many guys saw Tubin on our podcast? We enjoy talking to him. How many guys saw Cuomo on our podcast? How many guys have seen Sammy the Bull Gravano on our podcast? How many guys have seen, I don't know, uh, Alex Jones on the podcast or DeSouza or, uh, or Kobe Bryant or I don't know, all these, I like talking to everybody. I feel like the, the role, everybody's playing a different role in this battle we're going to face in the next decade, two or three. We're all dressed in different uniforms. We all love America, but we all are playing a different role. Everyone's got a different superpower. I feel like the one we're playing is like this. Hey, man, can we sit down and talk? Can we do that? I read a book with Tip O'Neill and, uh, and uh, uh, Ronald Reagan. They could talk, right? Can we sit down and have a conversation together? Yes. Okay. Tell me about your upbringing. Tell me about your upbringing. Interesting. You guys have that in common as father, with fathers. Y yeah, I guess we do. What sport do you like? Oh, no shit, you too. You guys have that in common. An hour later, do you realize you guys agree on 73 different things? What do you disagree on? Politically, five different things? Let's hash it out and debate. It's okay. Some like Red Sox, some like Yankees. Let's debate it out. Some like Lakers, some like, well, today you can't like the Lakers, but some used to like the Lakers. Don't get me started. I don't want to go there. But you get the idea what I'm, I'm trying to get people talking to one another. But by the way, what happens before a husband and wife get a divorce? What's the easiest sign? What's the easiest sign that a divorce is around the corner? What is, they stop talking. And if you don't talk to each other, what do you not do at night? Back to back. You know how hard it is to have sex back to back? Not a lot of gifted people like that, but you can't have sex back to back. I was a little bit mathematical and scientific. If some of you guys got it, good for you. If you didn't get it, God bless you. It's going to be all right. I want to talk to everybody. I want to sit down and talk and say, let's talk. I disagree. You disagree with me? Let's start the discussion, okay? A, a part of the challenge is that we also feel we can only talk to people that agree with us. How does that make any sense? If we only talk to people that agree with us, then, then what opportunity are we given to baptize people in the name of whatever the United States of America? If we're only going to talk to people that agree with us, where is the debate? How are you getting better? How am I getting stronger? We've got to sit down and have some of these conversations. Maybe this is not a message some of you guys agree with. I'm comfortable with that. I want to do that. I didn't say don't be paranoid. I didn't say be naive. If you have the ability to reason and manage expectations with people in your life, you can call out BS and still have a respectful conversation with somebody. Who's ever seen the movie Roadhouse with Patrick Swayze? Who's seen the movie Roadhouse? How many guys love the movie Roadhouse? Okay. Man, I love the movie Roadhouse. You know what's one of the best scenes in a movie? It's when the, uh, all the, all the, what do you call it, all the security guys, the, the bouncers are sitting there and they're talking to Patrick Swayze. And what does he say to him? Ask him to leave, but be nice. If they try to do this, ask him to leave, but be nice. What if he calls your mama? Is she? If you know the movie, you know what line that is. Whatever they do, just be nice. We can have, unless if you're Anthony Weiner and you disrespect, then we don't have to be nice because you crossed the line. But if you come to me and respectful, let's have a conversation together and see what we can do. That's half the battle. If we don't talk to each other, 
we're going through a divorce very soon. And if you're a leader amongst leaders, you don't fear talking to people whom you and they disagree with. It's okay to talk to them. Half the reason why Charlie is doing such a great job, he goes and talks to everybody on these campuses. You think it's easy being on the other side? What is the possibility of somebody doing something to Charlie? It takes courage what this Turning Point USA organization does on a regular basis with these kids. It takes a lot of courage. So I'm down to my last three minutes here, and I got, I got a bunch of other things, but I'll just wrap it up here with a couple points, and we'll send it off and, and go from there. You know, for me, um, there's different ways that we can contribute, all of us. Some of you are here, you get to contribute with time. You don't have money. You're like, look, I don't have any money, but I'm 19 years old. I can contribute with time. Awesome. Do it. Some of you may be retired and you have some money, but you can contribute with your time. You can't speak like Charlie Kirk, or you can't speak like Glenn Beck or some of these incredible speakers, but you can give your time. Some of you don't have time, but you have money. That's one way you can give money to whatever different programs he's working with or anything else you're doing. You can give with money. But some of you guys that have a voice, this next few years, I am convinced. I'm so convinced. My favorite hat, slogan that we have on every one of our gears, it says, future looks bright. I don't know why. I am so optimistic about what's about to happen next. I think we're going to see a movement of some of the most incredible leaders being born during these chaotic times. We're going to meet leaders where we're going to sit there and say, where did, where did he come from? Where did she come from? What was this all about? We needed to have a massive crisis for us to wake up and realize what was worth fighting for, and both freedom and America is worth fighting for. Thank you so much, everybody. Appreciate you. Thank you.